Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Action Plan uh, Community Advisory Task Force meeting for Clackamas County for Thursday, September 8th. We'll begin in a few moments. We'll just allow a little bit more time for uh, task force members to join. I'm seeing some task force members in the attendee space and I'm promoting them into the panelist space. That's great. Thanks very much, Evan. Just an FYI, Evan, it was a little more cumbersome for me to get in, to log in. It just wasn't a simple login. I, was, I had to log in through my Zoom account and get a verification code and all this stuff. So I'm going to be taking people a little more time. Okay, thanks, Dave. Yeah, we can look at uh, how we can make that as easy as possible to join. We don't want there to be a lot of hurdles. Just as a note, uh, my Zoom would not log in until I updated my Zoom program. And then it logged in fine. So I, I don't know, Dave, if that's what was going on with yours. I didn't say that. I just wanted to, I guess, make sure that I was I <laughs> or I was me. <laughs> Okay, several more folks have joined us in the last couple of minutes. Hi, Kim. Hello, Zach. Julie, welcome. Adam, hi. Okay, well, uh, why don't we get underway? So uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all again and be back together. Uh, my name is Evan Polk, and I am the manager for the county's sustainability and solid waste program. And we're excited to be able to reconvene our uh, community advisory task force uh, for the climate action plan here today. Um, our our, our two-hour meeting will be coordinated and led by our consulting team, uh, SSG. And I'll hand it off in a moment to them. I just want to note that uh, today's meeting will include some time for public comment. I believe it's scheduled towards the end of the meeting. And um, this meeting is also uh, being recorded and will later be posted to the county's website. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, pass it on to uh, Brittany. Thanks so much, Evan. And thanks everyone for joining us um, this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna get into a presentation here, but it will be very interactive. Um, so I hope we can enjoy our uh, next two hours together. Uh, I just want to provide, I pass it over. I, sorry, the recording pausing and starting is uh, distracting me. Um, before I pass it over to Naomi, our facilitator for this evening, or sorry, this afternoon where you are, um, I just want to let you know some pre-reads did go out yesterday. Um, don't feel like you had to rush through those. Um, there is a lot of information in them. We're gonna talk about everything today. Um, and you'll also have time to digest everything afterwards if that's what works better for you because we will leave all opportunities to participate online for at least a week and you can always reach us as well. So I just wanted to pro provide you with that note right off the bat. Um, other than that, welcome. And I'm going to turn it right over to Naomi as I share my screen and Naomi will kick it off for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, it's really lovely to meet everybody. Um, my name is Naomi Devine, and I'm a member owner of SSG, and I have been a climate action planner for just under two decades, uh, which is something that honestly still surprises me. I feel, I still feel like when I started out that the field is new, um, and there's still so much, of course, that we're learning, but we've advanced quite far, I can assure you, you know, so since that time. Um, I also um, am the engagement lead, so I specialize in, in that in terms of uh, seeing engagement as shared influence, you know, or shared decision making, and and we're going to talk a, a bit more about that essentially today. Um, and I'm also the design lead, so lots of different wear lots of different hats. Uh, you know, sort of here at SSG, 
and I'm really pleased that our team can um, join you for this portion um, of Clackamas's, uh, you know, climate action plan and climate action planning process. Um, I'm just having an extension cord um, sort of delivered to me. Thank you so much. Um, here as well, because I don't want to lose power while we're all chatting today. All right, so welcome back to the CATF members, um, and it, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. I know you've worked with other members of our team, so I'm going to throw it over to the county to do the land acknowledgement, and then we'll dive into the meeting. Okay, well, um, uh, we have uh, typically in our meetings uh, taken a moment uh, to acknowledge that uh, the place we call Clackamas County was the traditional, is the traditional lands and waterways of uh, the Clackamas, Chinook, Kalapuya, Kathlamet, Malala, Multnomah, Tualatin, Tumwater, Wasco, and many other tribes of the Willamette Valley. And um, so uh, we wanted to do that again in this meeting as we kick off. Um, I will not uh, take the time to, to read um, the full uh, text in front of you, um, but I hope you have read it um, previously. And um, we'll just linger for it uh, for a moment on this and then um, back to SSG. Wonderful. So we want to kick off a bit. I told you a bit about me and we've got other members of our team here too. So I'll get them to introduce themselves in a moment. And of course, we want to get to know you. Um, over the course of the next four meetings, we want to make sure that we um, start to sort of come together as a group. So we're going to develop our own, of course, group dynamics, you know, a sort of personality. And as Brittany mentioned, we have a lot of interactivity, but we'd also like a lot of conversation. You know, we're not just here to um, you know, be on broadcast. We also want to, of course, be on receive and learn about what matters most to you, um, how you're finding, you know, how things are going. And we have a lot of information. This isn't, these are going to be information, of course, heavy sessions. And the idea too, as Brittany said, is the pre-reads are optional because we want to make sure that we cover the material with you um, live and then give you time afterwards too, to continue to digest it. So please don't think that um, the meeting today is the only time, of course, for you to provide the feedback that we're asking for. These materials will be provided to you as well. And the opportunity to continue to comment outside of this meeting um, will take place too. So I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, so I've introduced myself. Brittany, did you want to introduce yourself? yourself a bit more? Yeah, thanks, Naomi. So my name is Brittany McLean. Uh, I am also a member owner of Sustainability Solutions Group, um, and I've been in the climate action world and uh, organizational strategy world for about 12 years. Um, I, I uh, am the lead analyst on this project, so you would have met uh, other lead analysts previously. I've taken this project over. Um, so you'll see me at every single one of these meetings, as long, along with the rest of our team here. Um, so my role is to uh, support the analysis of the modeling and data that uh, Chris is working through the model um, and also forming, uh, working with you and with other stakeholders to form uh, and deliver recommendations based on our analysis. Um, and I will pass it over to Kiana. Hi folks, my name is Kiana Bonick. I'm also a consultant at SSG and part of the engagement team. Um, my experience comes from um, five plus years in community engagement and particularly discussing with folks around climate change in a way that is relatable to folks. So I'll be part of the engagement team along with Naomi here to help us with this whole process. And I'll pass it over to Chris. Hi all, uh, I've met I think almost all of you before. Uh, it's good to see you all again, it's been a while. Um, as you know, I've been uh, leading the, the charge on the modeling side, uh, kind of more the, the technical aspects of this project and uh, I look forward to, to chatting with you and answering any questions you might have. Fantastic. Okay, so I believe, do we have the first mentee here, Kiana? All right. Oh, will share that link. Um, Fantastic. So this is where we're going to sort of start with the interactive nature of the meeting. So there's uh, can I'll leave it to Canada. There's multiple ways for you to get in to participate and also just make sure you have your chat open to be able to receive links from us and also answers to your questions. Yep. So for mentee, so as Naomi mentioned, there are multiple ways for you folks to join today. Um, so the, the instructions on the slide presents two. Um, so the first one is you can open a new browser or even you have a cell device or a mobile device beside you. You can open your browser and go to menti.com. They'll ask you for a code, which the code is on the screen there. So the 9667-9008. Alternatively, you'll also, if you have your phone, you can take a picture of the QR code. It'll automatically bring you to uh, the menti. Or the third way is if you open your Zoom chat, there will be a link directly to the menti itself. And you'll click there and you should be in the, Zoom, in the menti room itself. So we'll give folks um, some time to join uh, before we move on. 
So if you have any issues, no problem, just raise your hand uh, or you can open up the Q&A and send us a question that way, or you can let us know in the chat, whatever you prefer, but we'll be able to get you, we'll be able to get you in there. And I also just wanna let you know as well that um, this entire presentation this evening is uploaded into Mentimeter. So it's not just a tool for interacting with us. You will be able to see the slides in there as well. Um, and that will be open. This is one of the um, the pieces that we're leaving open after the end of this meeting. If you decide that you have additional comment or for those folks that couldn't join us uh, this evening. And then they'll have the recording. Ideally, what we want is for you to not have to worry too much or have a burden about preparing for these meetings. We'll take you um, through everything that you need to know. And then you've got time, you know, sort of afterwards to take it all in. Of course, we're happy to have questions, of course, in advance, you know, as well. But I uh, want you to feel like you, you are ready to just show up and we're going to provide you with the information that you need to participate effectively. How's Mentimeter looking, Kiana? We've got a good amount of participants in there. Yep, I guess we'll give it a bit of time. Is anyone not able to get into Mentimeter using their browser or their phone? And the link is directly in the chat as well. So the very direct link, if you click on that, it'll take you exactly to the presentation. Um, all right. Good to go? Yep. All right, thanks everyone. All right, so like, yeah, we're already in there. So we'd love for you to introduce yourself and your uh, role in your organization as well to see who we've got in the room. So welcome everyone. Welcome Cassie and Zachary and Marion. Dave, Julie, and Bill. We have a couple of Bills with us today, so welcome to everyone. Valerie, this is great. Jeff, Julia, and Julie, too. Fantastic. It's really good to see a really great cross section of representation um, on the CATF um, as well. So wonderful that you want to um, you you're dedicating your time um, to working on this project with us all. Adam, welcome. I want to say thanks to everyone for, for doing this, for reintroducing yourselves. I know most of you know each other, um, but we don't yeah. know you yet. So we do appreciate it. And know. it has been a pretty big pause for everybody. So exactly. In case Hi. you forget. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. All right. Fantastic. Let's move on to the next one. And Kim, I saw your name there. So let's take a look at today's session objectives. So you'll want to keep Mentimeter open. We're going to return to Mentimeter later on in today's presentation as well to receive feedback um, from you as well. So the objectives today are to consult on implementation options. So we're going to present those um, to you, the state of the implementation plan, um, and go through that with you in detail. And then we're going to ask you some important questions on the options in front of you. Um, so we're doing that in order to move forward with climate action, of course, in Clackamas County. And we want to involve you, so all interested parties, that include yourselves, in understanding community values, aspirations and the climate readiness essentially for the climate action plan. Um, after having done um, these types of plans in a, a hundred different communities of different sizes um, and in different countries, uh, we've learned a lot you know, about the importance of understanding values and aspirations and assessing climate readiness essentially because once we hand this over, it really is up to you, the community and of course Clackamas County to make sure that it becomes a real, um, real thing. So we're here to help share that expertise with you in order to set you up for as much success as possible. Next slide. So in, in terms of the agenda, we'll just look at that quickly. So we've done welcome and introductions. Thank you very much for your participation in that. We're going to dive into a project review, and then we're going to take a look at the low carbon scenario results. So the work, the summary of the work essentially done to date, and we want to get your reactions to the low carbon scenario itself. And then we're going to do an introduction to the implementation guide. There's an opportunity at the end of this meeting, of course, for public comment, and then we will review next steps with you. And at the end of the meeting, too, we'll place an evaluation link um, for you to let us know how we're doing, and that will help you shape um, uh, the meetings, you know, sort of going forward as well. Um, and no problem, Bill, what we'll do is um, we'll put the Menti link back into the chat for you, and it's a direct link, so you don't even need a code. Once you click on that link, you'll be able to get right onto it. Thanks for letting us know. All right, so let's talk about operating values, basically the sort of guidelines that we want to set 
um, together in order to work successfully together and make this an enjoyable experience um, for everyone. We understand you've had a charter as well. So we want to, um, we also want to introduce you to um, Miro. And so Kiana is going to throw the Miro link into the chat as well for you to, um, for you to dive in there. And we want to have a sort of a refresh and a reset of group values based on experience. And we've got a couple of other questions um, essentially for you. Is it easy enough for you to share your screen for Miro as well? You're doing a lot here, Kiana. So let me know, or if you would like me to share my screen, I can also share my screen. I can share my screen. Fantastic. I'm not surprised. Quite the, <laughs> you're very, very adept at this. The reason we also want to show you Miro, not only to ask you the questions, is this is also going to be a digital home in between meetings um, for all of you members. Um, and so um, essentially, we'll be able to throw information into here that you'll be able to see, and it can act like the way we use it, like a big dashboard. So you only have to remember kind of one place or mostly one place to go. We can throw the link to Mentimeter um, in here too. Um, and what I would love um, for you to do um, once you dive in here, and I see a few of you are in here, so I'll just wait a moment. Um, but if you can zoom into um, the webinar etiquette first, Kiana, and I'll go over that, and then we'll go into the questions once everybody's in. So just to your left. If, uh, is, it, is it being difficult? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so just a couple tips too for Zoom webinar um, as well. And like someone noted, you know, it's a little bit different even getting into Zoom webinar, you need a different type of invite. Um, and sometimes, yeah, Zoom will be insist on updating, you know, before getting you in. We want you to open the chat um, to be able to receive links and additional information. Or if you ask us questions in the chat, we'll respond to you in the chat as well, or we'll, or we'll respond live, but that way we can record all of the questions that you have for us and make sure that we don't miss anything. Um, if you want to ask us a question, please use the raise hand function, use the chat or use the Q&A, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, all of those pathways will get to us and we'll make sure that we um, come to you. Um, and just as a note, like sort of a bit of a tip, it's it's generally more difficult to use Zoom webinar from a phone or a mobile device. Um, and so to, to be able to fully participate and, and have a frustration level um, with digital, you know, sort of technology as low as possible, um, we recommend that you log into the CATF meetings um, in Zoom webinar on your desktop that will give you the best um, experience with the tool we have found. All right, so let's go over to the three questions that we have for you. And it's very easy to participate. So we've created a bunch of stickies below and we wanna know three things. The first one here is what matters most to you about implementing effective climate action in Clackamas County? And what, uh, I've duplicated the question. The next question should be, what do you, for operating values on the blue one, um, what do we need to do to work best, you know, sort of together? So essentially what I wanna hear um, from you here is what has worked for you in the past? Do we need to make sure that we start and end on time? That's something that we definitely, you know, sort of will do, but you can feel free to get as specific as possible with us with respect to what have you, um, what types of group behaviors and group norms and guidelines have you had before that have led to successful um, group meeting experiences for you? We want you to put them all in there and get as specific as possible. I will group them and summarize them and then bring them back to the group as well to confirm that we got everything, but we want to know how we can set everything, um, set these sessions up to be as successful as possible possible. And then hey, the Naomi. Last... Yep. Naomi, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt, but it looks like if I zoom way out on this mural board, there are three or four folks who probably are zoomed way to the below and right of the sticky notes. Um, so if you don't see anything, you might need to zoom out and, and look up and to the left. The other thing you can do, you can go to your upper right hand corner and you should see uh, a yellow circle with a little lightning bolt beside it. That's Naomi. And so if you click on her, it will actually bring you right to where she is and she's in the right spot. So if you're having any trouble, just go up to that corner there and click on that lightning bolt and you'll get to where you need to be. Yeah, thank you for that. And also I can click on it and I brought you all to me. So Evan, you should see those people who might've been somewhere else in the board. They should now be over in our general area. And I'll do it one more time. And so now yeah, everybody is fully aware of how powerful Naomi is. So that's yeah. <laughs> Set the, we've set the record straight right off the bat and um there we go <laughs> yeah thank you so much for that then our last question here is what makes clackamas county a great place to live i have seen some very interesting answers over the years um in terms of uh what people think uh, makes the where they live the best place ever so i'm always excited to see what people say um about where they live some of you are already participating on here which is wonderful um so go to it um we don't want to stop you for those of you for whom um miro is new um the sticky note is the easiest way 
um, to do that. And no problem, William. Thank you for letting us know. I'll let, um, if you want to put in the chat what you would like to put on a sticky, we will grab it out of the chat for you and put it onto the board live um, for you. Because yeah, it's, it's harder to participate like this on an iPad, but no problem. We'll be able to capture your feedback um, to you. You can throw it into the chat to the hosts and panelists, or you can send it to myself or Kiana directly, either way, and we will um, we'll throw that on the board for you. So all you need to do is yeah, take your cursor and grab a sticky note. So one of those purple or pink or blue or yellow or green ones below. And then as soon as you click on it, you just uh, pull it to where you'd like it to go. And if you double click, you can start typing. You can also use the four handles on the corners to resize um, the size of the um, sticky note. Um, it doesn't need to be big. Um, as soon as you start typing, um, the text will change size in order to accommodate the box that it's in. And you can even resize it afterwards as well. So as long as you type what you want to type in there, We'll make sure that we get it. I have spoken a lot. So if you need me to repeat any of those directions, uh, I am more, of course, than happy um, to do that. Please do make sure that you let us know, though, too, what are those successful elements of, of working together in that middle board there? Um, often people will say things too, like, and I'll get Kiana and, and uh, Chris and uh, Brittany to share theirs as well. Um, often people will say what uh, they want, you know, respect, we should respect each other. Definitely, we should respect each other. But what does respect look like to you? Because to me, it might look like something different than it does, you know what I mean, essentially to you. Part of respect for me is, of course, making sure that we start and end on time, or that we make sure that we listen to as many voices, you know, as possible, um, for example. So the more specific you can get, the better the experience, I think, will be. Um, Kiana, what would you say is something that you think leads to successful meetings in terms of operating values? Um, from what I've seen in the past is fun that we're all here and it's not fun in a like very, I guess, goofy way, but in, in, we're here to share ideas and, and people always look forward to for creativity and innovation and in these discussions. Fantastic. Chris, what about you? You've gone to 8,000 meetings. What works? Um, just, uh, yeah, participating and, and being interactive. Um, so sometimes I know it, uh, information gets uh, thrown at you really quickly and, and sometimes you need to, to, to think and uh, and process that information, but uh, engaging as best we can is, is always helpful. Fantastic. Um, I find for me too, especially since we've moved into the digital world, um, also just we're going to have lots of patience, you know, too, um, in case, uh, you know, something kind of goes funny, you know, technology wise, Miro earlier today, for example, was just freezing on me, you know, for some reason, we'll have lots of patience, um, you know, sort of with each other, I find is helpful too in this sort of digital age um, of meeting. What about you, Brittany? What have you found that works in the, the 17,000 meetings you've gone to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 17,000. I think that's pretty accurate, actually. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, open communication, tell us what you need. Um, I don't like to talk at people, I like to have discussions. Um, members of my team have heard this probably a million times uh, from me, but uh, we're all humans first. Um, so definitely, you know, if there's an issue with technology, if you don't quite understand something, if you, you know, need us to meet your needs in a different way, just let us know, you know, um, I promise we'll respond in a human way and not in a robot -y consultant way. So, um, yeah, Wonderful. that's what works for me. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Kiana, are you able to grab William's comments and Dave's comments that they've put in the chat to put them on the mirror board? Yep. If not, translate them over. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> That's fantastic. So thank you so much, Williams. Yeah, sufficient time to engage and not be overmanaged. Yeah. And um, David said, uh, making the plan as practicable as possible, um, work together in more in the live interactive format and working in smaller groups in the past has worked well, of course, to share ideas as well. Thank you for that. That's why you'll also see that we have uh, the mural board up like this is also it's an opportunity for you to get to participate in a way that's different from having to speak. Not everyone wants to speak in front of a group or that's not the best way, of course, that they share or process their ideas. So you'll see us providing you with multiple formats um, in order to get your feedback, you know, as well. Of course, we do, as I mentioned, want to make this as conversational as possible. So we're going for a balance of sharing enough information with you to participate effectively um, and then wanting to converse with you, you know, sort of as well on the important um, parts of this project um, um, in order to make it as best as possible for Clackamas County. So we're going to leave that board open. You can keep answering during the meeting if you'd like to as well. If you're somebody who likes to multitask and or helps you to listen sometimes to do something else in the background, um, it's there. This mirror link will stay open. It will stay this way um, throughout our entire time together. Uh, we'll continue to put it in emails for you in case you lose it. But if you want to bookmark it, that is also a good idea too, because we'll, we'll share also lots of important information um, in here for you too. So think of it as your 
as a digital home um, and a digital dashboard home for us um, to use together. All right, let's go back to the presentation, please. I'm also a fast talker, which I'm sure has become apparent to everyone. Uh, if I'm ever going too fast, uh, feel free to also throw in the chat that you need me to slow down or repeat something. Uh, it will not take any offense to that. It turns out it's very hard to change that quality about yourself, but I work on it. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna throw it over to Brittany to take a look at the project review. All right, perfect. Thank you, Naomi. Um, so I'm going to bring you through this is a lot of information. Once again, uh, I will stop for questions. Um, if questions come up while I'm speaking, please put them in the chat. Um, I do want to note we are, you know, that wasn't just an example. We are very big on starting on time and ending on time here. Um, so if we do not get to your question today, we absolutely will take it down. We will get back to you. We'll put the answers out to the whole group. Um, so please uh, don't leave here feeling like your questions will not get answered. They always will. Um, so I'll dive into this now. Uh, so we're completed. So where we're at in the process. So you've been through, you know, much of this. Um, we've we went through the exploring the local context, of course, collecting data in, in order to be able to build our model and to understand uh, everything we can about Clackamas County, the policies, the culture, the community, the environment. Um, and then we went into our modeling process, the business is planned, uh, um, uh, uh, future scenario came out of that. Um, so you would have seen that and had an opportunity to comment on that. Um, the target was already set in this case, in the case of Clackamas County, it is carbon neutral. And that was uh, set by the board in advance of uh, the process beginning. Um, and then we developed uh, just recently, and I'm going to talk a lot about this during this meeting, the low carbon pathway and financial analysis. So I know um, many of the meetings that you've had before were, were focused on low carbon actions and the low carbon pathway. We have now taken all of that feedback and finalized the low carbon pathway with the county. I'm going to really dive into what that means and what modeling does and what it doesn't and what opportunities there still are to engage. Having the low carbon pathway does not mean that engagement is done by any means. Um, so now we're at this phase of the implementation guide. So how are we going to get the work done? How are we going to get to a low carbon pathway in Clackamas County? That is the big question that we're trying to answer. And I would say probably the central question to this whole project. Um, and then once we finish that up, we will develop uh, for the county, of course, a monitoring and evaluation framework um, to move forward with. Um, and sorry, I have it written there as a carbon accounting tool. Uh, we use a number of different names. So I've clarified with the county, it is a climate lens that we are developing uh, in this case. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about our team and our approach. So you met us all uh, briefly and what we do. Um, we really take this approach of analyzing and engaging. So uh, on one side, we have the energy and emissions modeling, of course, that's been a huge central focus. We do a technical analysis. We analyze all of that data. We do financial modeling and analysis. Please excuse my Canadian spelling on this slide. Um, and we also engage at the same time. So we do iterative community engagement. Um, we've been speaking with yourselves and with a number of other stakeholders um, throughout this process. I'm going to talk about the engagement that we've been doing since uh, we last spoke with the CATF group in particular. Um, and we look at local knowledge, policies, all of those things I mentioned before. And so those things inform one another. So we go back and forth. So we analyze, we engage, we analyze, we engage. Um, and so there's also always the uh, opportunity for the analysis that we're doing through modeling and data collection to influence the engagement process and for the engagement process to um, influence what we're analyzing. Um, so now that we're talking about engagement, I am gonna hand it right back over to Naomi uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what that is before I get into my, uh, to any further review. Okay, thanks very much, Brittany. I get this in question, of course, a lot. Um, and my team knows exactly how um, opinionated I am on, on, on the topic. Essentially, think of engagement more as shared influence over an outcome than an event, you know, sort of per se, because it often sort of comes up like, you know, in terms of engagement, I'll take, you know, an open house and I'll take, you know, a cup of survey, you know, and a side of a couple of tweets every week for six weeks, you know, for example, too. And we don't um, sort of work 
um, on, you know, sort of drive through, um, you know, or event planning only approach to engagement. It's a question of um, what is the scope of the project? What is the scope of the engagement? I'll get into that in a minute. And is there room for influence? And if there is, that's the engagement conversation, right? And then we get into defining, you know, how much and of what type and, you know, what's going to be most relevant. So it's any process that involves the public. Uh, in problem solving or decision making and uses that public input to make sustainable decisions. Who do we mean by the public? It's a pretty broad term um, and it needs to be defined in each process, but it's any individual group of individuals, organizations or political entity with an interest in the outcome of a decision. Let's go to the next slide. So when I mentioned that too, there's of course a scope of a project, which is sort of the universe of uh, concerns and interests that are important to various affected parties. And then there's the concerns and interests that can be addressed in this process. Climate change, of course, itself is a large topic. There's all other aspects of climate change and climate action um, that are, are that need to be a part of the discussion, you know, in general, um, that are outside of the scope of this, you know, particular project. So we'll be clear with you about what scoping, you know, that we're doing at each stage. Um, and of course, that depends on where we are in the project um, and we're in the sort of later stages of this project. So we make sure that we keep the engagement focused on um, what it is that you can influence um, and what we need from you to help influence that. Um, and, and, and we're gonna stay away from essentially like broader, you know, sort of topics around climate action because we're it, it, with each step, we're getting closer and closer to being done. So we get more granular as we go along. Next slide, please. So good engagement is, of course, we do a why before we do a how. So, you know, before you need a workshop, you need to talk about why you need, you know what I mean, the workshop. So we need um, the strategic advice um, that you folks can give us and anything too. And that's why you've been selected to be on the CATF um, as well. We talk about strategy before tactics, you know, again, too. Um, a survey is sometimes, it's a tactic and it's sometimes the wrong thing to deploy. Um, if we need to speak to a broader defined group of the public and they don't have as much time to say, sit on a, um, a committee like this, then we know why we need to talk to them because we need a broad set of input on something. Um, and then the tactic to reach them often is something like a survey. It's not, of course, the only one, it's just one example. So what this really means in, when we translate it into uh, engagement planning language is we, we set our objectives, and I went over those at the beginning of this meeting, before we choose our tactics. So there was an objective in the engagement plan that pointed to needing a CATF, for example, and why we need the CATF. Next slide, please. There are seven core values of public participation in the IAP2 framework. IAP2 stands for International Association of Public Participation, and it's the only internationally recognized um, uh, framework for um, community or public engagement um, that exists. Uh, I'm one of those practitioners, and so the engagement approach that we have developed is based on is based on this framework itself. Let's go to the next slide. I won't read all the values out to you. We're going to give you the presentation. The spectrum of engagement, if you've heard of it before, is the most famous part of the methodology. There's 21 steps in the methodology, but the spectrum actually helps us answer that question of, so if there is influence, how much, you know, and what type essentially too. And so we're in the involved collaborate um, sort of sphere or, or sorry, um, spot on this spectrum, you know, essentially too. So what you're going to be seeing if we, if we, took this to a dinner analogy at the involved level um, in terms of giving um, folks that I'm inviting to dinner influence over how much, you know, or what type of dinner that we're going to have. At the involved level, I'm asking you questions that based on what do you like to eat? You know, what are some of your favorite things? Are you allergic to anything? So that I don't create a meal that's going to harm you accidentally. Um, you know, for example, tell me about a time, you know, that dinner was terrible so that I can also avoid a failure. You know what I mean? Sort of outcome, right? <laughs> kind of thing too. What, if I were to screw up dinner, you know, what kind of dinner would I give you? What kind of experience would you have? Then I take that information in and I come back to you with options based on what you've told me. The collaborate level looks like this. Um, why don't you bring over um, some ingredients that you like? We'll take a look at what I have in my kitchen. You know, when you get here, I've got some tools and let's make something, you know, sort of together um, for dinner that's going to satisfy us all. So that's the, that's the part of the spectrum that we're at. And so, um, and the CATF has been geared at that level um, as well. Let's go to the next slide. So let's get really specific then about what does that look like practically um, for our time together and at this stage of the project. Um, we're going to take a look over these meetings at the implementation guide, and we want to know from you how should we implement low carbon actions in each sector and using sequestration. In terms of actions and implementation, what action should we take and how do we implement actions relating to resilience and consumption-based emissions? We really need to hear from you about where that could go well and where that could maybe not go so well, things we should avoid. We're gonna review the draft plan and the ancillary reports. 
And of course, we want to know from you how you want to participate in implementation. I talked a little bit about climate readiness at the beginning of this meeting and our experience, of course, working with, um, you know, uh, at least 100 communities, um, you know, on that and assessing climate readiness is a really key factor, key criteria for success. Next slide. All right, so it's that question time. We don't want to be too overly managed. So we're just hopefully we're getting that balance between sharing information with you um, and hearing you know, from you as well. So what questions do you have for us so far? If you're in Mentimeter still, you can use um, Mentimeter or you can use any of the other options um, that, we've get, uh, that we have. So the chat itself, you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak to us too. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we will unmute you and uh, or use the Q&A function. Hey, Bill. Just a quick question. This uh, slide presentation wasn't in the original uh, packet that was sent out. Is this, are we going to have this or do we need this? Yep. So as I mentioned before, we want you to just be able to show up to the meeting. We'll present you with the information and then yes, we'll follow up afterwards so that you'll get the slides as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Okay, seeing none for now, let's carry on. Oh, we had one there. I'm unclear at where the larger process is at as far as bringing recommendations to the county board. I think, Brittany, you're going to get into that a bit too. Is that correct? Yeah, I can cover that briefly now, though, um, and, and then Cheryl or Evan, if you want to jump in, please do so. Um, so at this point, um, the board presentation of the final plan will be in uh, the first quarter of 2023. Um, and so we are going through this process now. Like I mentioned, we finished the low carbon modeling. So now it's all about how we do this. We're developing an implementation guide, which we're going to talk about today. You're going to have input on and influence over. Um, and we're developing the climate lens and then we're developing the final report that will all go to the board together as a package early in 2023. Um, so we have an engagement process um, with the CATF, uh, with the broader public and with um, a senior management team within the county uh, before we get to that uh, that phase in order to finish up. Cheryl or Ebene, is there anything you wanted to add there? No, Brittany, that's exactly right. That's kind of our plan. Hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl Bell, staff for Clackamas County. Um, we, we are planning to present the, the climate action plan to the board in early 2023. Um, and be able to bring it to them in, pol in two separate policy sessions. That's what staff have requested. As those kind of come up and as we kind of get to the end of our engagement together, we'll make sure we provide, um, I know Brittany's talked about ways uh, for how all of you can include your voice in that plan. And then um, we'll share more with you as we go through the um, process of engaging with the board so you can be aware of those dates and opportunities. And um, Brittany, there's also a comment in the chat from Valerie Pratt about asking, what is the 20 minute neighborhood? And I yeah. have a link that I can share, but yeah, Brittany, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll explain that really quickly. A 20 minute neighborhood, it's basically just a dense mixed use um, community in an, in an urban environment. And so the idea behind a 20 minute neighborhood is that using active transportation or transit, somebody could meet all of their needs within 20 minutes. So housing, uh, employment, you know, dentist's office, doctor's office, groceries, all the things that you would need. And the idea behind that is that those are sustainable communities where people can kind of live their full lives um, without uh, without having to use um, a vehicle too much of the time. All right, so let's move on here. Um, I'm going to give you the key update. So the low carbon scenario has been finalized. So we did, uh, the the decision was made at the county level uh, to move forward with the low carbon scenario and finalize that based on the input that we had. Uh, so I will be sharing that back with you this evening. We have incorporated much of the feedback that was received from the previous sessions of the CATF, um, as well as um, some uh, input that we had from 
the county's implementation team, um, and that is a team made up of senior managers at the county level. Um, the implementation guide is also in draft form. So basically, I'll explain this more as we go on. Modeling is really the what. So modeling is a great thing. Being able to see the impact of different actions and decisions that are taken is really important to understand where that gets us on the trajectory to our carbon neutral target. Um, but modeling does have its limitations. It is a what type exercise. So what happens to emissions when you replace 50% of gasoline vehicles with electric vehicles? What happens when you use, um, when 50% of your natural gas is renewable natural gas? So those are the types of questions that modeling can answer. And, and then again, over what time span and over what geographic area. So it's really great at um, being able to test out solutions. What modeling doesn't tell us is how to implement those solutions. So that is a conversation between us and you. Um, it relies on our expertise, having done this for over 100 communities. It relies on understanding the community context, what's unique about Clackamas County, what is the uh, energy landscape at the moment, What's the culture like? What are people, what is the climate readiness like? Um, so all of those pieces come together um, and help us understand how we can actually implement those actions. And so looking back um, at the past CATF meetings, looking back at the input and insights that were received, I've noticed that a lot of times we've already kind of like creeped into that how question. And that's that's natural. That's where our brains go. It's really People will get really creative and start thinking about um, these really great innovative solutions. How can we make this happen in our community? Um, so we've taken the feedback that we've received so far. And again, we've talked with the implementation team at the county and we've used our background um, to come in and develop a draft implementation guide. That is what we're really looking for your input on now. Um, so that will be shared after this meeting. Um, and just to be clear, the implementation guide at this point it includes um, the sectors that have been modeled. So uh, the, the sectors that have been modeled are the sectors where we're, um, there are direct emissions happening within Clackamas County. So your waste, your buildings, your transportation. Um, we've made the decision not to model sequestration, but to look at the quantitative impact of sequestration out the model outside of the model because we can do we can actually do a better analysis and some more sensitivity around it that way. Um, so we're looking at both of those pieces in the current implementation guide, how we implement um, those, you know, direct sector sort of actions and sequestration actions. And we need to go through a similar exercise for consumption based emissions and resilience still. So you will have an opportunity to do that after the next workshop. Um, staff engagement, like I mentioned, we've, we've been working with that implementation team and receiving a lot of great feedback with that from them. We've had three meetings with them so far. And just so you're aware, after we have these meetings with the CATF on the implementation guide and gather your feedback um, and do some more public, um, or sorry, community engagement, we will be, creating a more polished version of the implementation guide that will go back out to the implementation team to see you know, how, how different stakeholders felt. So we will present to, back to them some of the themes we heard about. We've also been doing some community engagement. Um, so we did two community listening sessions, so two workshops um, that were focused on the low carbon scenario and implementation planning. Um, we're also getting into focus groups right now. So we'll be focusing on similar topics there. And the county put out a community survey, survey on the climate action plan. And I'm just gonna turn it over to Evan quickly uh, to speak on that because that was county led. And so he is the, the best person to speak to it. I've got two slides here for you, Evan. Great, thanks Brittany. So yes, one of the things that uh, has been underway uh, between uh, now and, and the prior uh, task force meeting is that the county conducted a uh, an open uh, public survey on climate action. Um, the survey was open for around uh, six weeks or so, and we had almost a thousand respondents. And uh, surprisingly, 
um, people who took the survey were really dedicated to participating. They spent um, on average 20 minutes in the survey uh, per person, which is a lot more than um, you often see in surveys. And uh, so the collective amount of time brought to uh, the survey was pretty impressive. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here's some really high level results. Um, basically, there was a really overall, a really strong sense uh, from among those who responded to the survey that uh, climate change is important or is very important. Um, there was pretty strong consensus around a, the fact that there's broadly shared responsibility to address climate change. That includes government at all levels, nonprofits, and the private sector. There was a lot of concern expressed about the current and expected impacts of climate change. And also uh, a pretty strong consensus that the county should act. Right, so that that looks like uh, maybe taking action in uh, our own facilities and operations, also supporting climate action within our community, and then advocating for action with other jurisdictions and organizations. A lot of people that took the survey also expressed a desire to take their own actions and um, noted that that they feel the need for more education or assistance to to make those actions happen. Uh, now we posted this uh, the the survey report to uh, the climate um, to the project website for the county, and I I think do we have the link here as well, Brittany? Yeah, I'm going to share the link in the chat. Okay, here. thank you so much. So uh, we'll post the link to uh, the project website for the county, and one of the most recent documents that was posted there are are the. Um, the summary results from uh, the English and Spanish language surveys. It's the same webpage where um, the, our, our CATF meetings are also summarized. So if you'd like to read the survey report and dig into it uh, more fully, um, you, can, you can find it there, uh, or I'd be happy to, to send it to you. And if you have any questions about it, uh, please, please follow up with me or when she's back from vacation, uh, Ellen Roglin, who I think you've met in this space previously. So that's what we had to share about the, the community-wide survey. Great, thank you, Evan. Um, we'll pause here um, for any additional questions about the work that has been done to date. And then I'm gonna jump right into presenting the low carbon and financial results. Great, thanks, Brittany. So from the chat, Bill um, is asking, are the modeled actions uh, set in stone now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to William and then Dave and then Jeff. Um, William says, does this mean by not modeling sequestration, we aren't addressing the county's 100,000 plus acres of forest in various ownerships? No, it does not. It is easier to, for us to address outside of the model. So we've been uh, we've been doing a lot of testing with the model. Um, and what we're realizing is that we can address it better, especially there's not a full consensus on the impact of different sequestration options or, or methods. And so we are using um, the, we're using a lot of the method, methods that are used across Oregon, but we wanna leave some room to, to just sort of give some different uh, interpretations. Right, so fair to say not to address in the model, but definitely being addressed. But absolutely addressed in the plan. It is a full section in the plan. Fantastic, thank you. Dave, over to you, then Jeff. And just, uh, just several quick questions, maybe points to consider. We're just following up on Bill's statement. Uh, since we haven't seen any uh, of your uh, basic assumptions regarding sequestration, I assume at some point you'll be outlining what it is that you're assuming regarding you talked about some various methods, whatever those are. So at some point we'll be seeing what it is you're assuming. So that's my first question. The second thing is, or a comment is that in looking at the survey, um, you know, it's not like a random poll where you surveyed a cross section of the county's residents looking at the results that you got it seemed like uh you know you're almost preaching to the choir there was a lot of folks that have a vested interest in this like us that uh, wanted to fill out that survey and so the results may be skewed from the standpoint of of you know is does this really represent what the county residents think and so i'm wondering if there's a way to get a a more full spectrum cross section of the county's thoughts on this to help guide public policy because if i was one of our county commissioners, I would just wonder, well, okay, what, what does the rest of the population think? 
And then the, and I think that's it at this point. So those are my two points. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna, if, if, if I'm I could, gonna, sorry, so if I could, since I'm kind of tagging well, on to him, I can. I can. <laughs> actually, well, actually, Jeff, I'd like to answer those questions first. Yeah. And I'll come to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the survey um, that the county issued the survey, and there's a difference between that I just want to highlight, and then we'll go to sequestration and Brittany or Chris, if, I'd like you to jump in. Um, is that there is a difference you've correctly identified it's not um, a market you know what I mean research based survey or a public opinion poll which you you know then you could say this is a statistically um, representative sample and then out of it you can say the community thinks x or y you know in terms of percentages um, there's other types of survey methodologies and uh, surveys like this um, in engagement tend to be um, they're in the category of uh, people who select in and have like lived or living experience and or interest, of course, in the topic. So while market based research or public opinion surveys measure uninformed opinion, meaning whether or not you know about climate change or the topic at hand um, is not required, you know, sort of to answer the questions because you're just sort of measuring that type of opinion and sort of understanding, I guess, depending on what you want to measure. Um, this is, of course, people who are, are interested in it. I, I wouldn't go so far as to assume that it's all people preaching to the choir, um, you know, as well. Um, but we would not be able to say you are correct, like that the X percent of the community, you know, sort of thinks this. That's why you see the results reported as X number percentage of respondents um, who filled out the survey. There is value, of course, in um, asking people who are interested to in um, answering questions um, what, the, what it is that they think about it, think about the topic, you know, or think about this particular project um, as well. So let's go to um, Brittany or Chris to answer the sequestration uh, part of the question, and then Jeff will come to you for yours. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Uh, as far as the methodology question on sequestration, absolutely, completely transparent. That will be shared back um, and it will be, when finalized, it will be shared in the report and as part of our data methods and assumptions manual. Fantastic. Thanks, Jeff, for waiting. Um, feel free to build on that or ask a new question. Yeah. I, I, sorry, I don't have much of a voice left. Um, I have a lot of the same concerns that Dave did, um, so I'm just kind of tagging on to that. It's as it's mostly a convenience survey and the people who were willing to put in all that time are also the most motivated and the most likely to be taking their own action anyway. How much value do we get from it? How much weight are we placing on it? And are we going to make any attempt to assess the perspectives of the people who aren't as motivated or who might not be as favored? Because that's the big majority of the folks who are going to be voting in the future. In the future. Thanks. Good question. And Evan, I might get you to jump in, you know, sort of after me, because I don't mean to speak, of course, for the county. So doing a public opinion poll wasn't part of the scope of the project for this particular project. However, what I would might recommend or is up for consideration, you know, too, for the CATF members is when you think about implementation, right? And I asked, I was asking those questions about what do you think would also set us up successfully, you know, to move into that implementation phase? Uh, because now is an excellent time to be asking those types of questions. And that might be a recommendation that you have for the county, you know, as well as to do public opinion poll. And perhaps maybe it's an annual, you know what I mean, sort of public opinion poll. Because certainly, and having been somebody who has worked in municipalities where I've had to actually be on the implementation side of a long-term plan, I had the fortunate um, experience to be in a place that had been implementing for 10 years. And I can tell you it was going to easily take us another 20 years to successfully implement the visions that folks, the community had put together 10 years previously. Previous. So it needs a constant, I think, set of monitoring and measuring and, you know, sort of tools to be in conversation, um, essentially with the public. And because as you move into implementation, things change on the ground, right? And often what would happen to in our particular case is we would think that action X would get us to destination Y and it took us to A you know, or something, and we needed to sort of learn and there needed to be a lot of iteration, you know, essentially um, on that. So I hear I hear those concerns. Again, I don't want to speak for the county, but in terms of my opinion, um, that's something that the CATF might want to consider as part of its recommendations as we move in this space. Yeah, and just uh, to build on that, I just, yeah. I just wanted to add one small piece, which is that, you know, we always, we invariably, when we get to the decision maker, they ask us about engagement, right? And they ask us about who was engaged and and, and whatnot. And, and I think another important perspective to, to keep in mind, um, and, and we always share this back with the decision maker, is this is a big plan. It spans your entire community. Um, you're going to be implementing it for the next 28 years. And so, um, uh, you know, we would strongly advise against using the engagement done in this plan to make decisions over, you know, that large span of time. And so we're 
gonna provide you with a draft implementation guide. It has a lot of um, suggested programs, policies, um, education pieces, advocacy pieces, and we would strongly recommend that as those individual mechanisms are being implemented, that there is engagement specifically on each one of those to ensure it's gonna meet the needs of the community. Um, so um, we're talking at broad level right now at a strategic plan level. And as we get into implementation, there's certainly more engagement to be done. Thank you. Evan, did you wanna, or Cheryl, did you have anything to add to that at this point? Um, I don't, I don't, not too much to say other than um, that, yeah, thank you everyone for, for pointing out, um, you know, that's correct about this survey. It was, it was an opt-in survey, not a poll. Um, that is something that my, from my understanding, the county uh, rarely, if ever does um, invest in, in terms of a, um, uh, like a, a scientific uh, representative poll that has a margin of error. Um, there are some numbers out there from uh, the Yale uh, climate program uh, that, that provide some county level, um, somewhat more uh, scientifically valid um, data that demonstrates a, a decent amount of support for um, climate action in the county. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, there's not been a, 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 a poll done, you know, designed specifically for um, our community that we know is is representative. Um, so we we certainly take the results, uh, you know, with with that grain of salt and just recognize that um, it's a sign that there's certainly a lot of people in our community who are very motivated um, to um, to for climate action. And we really just didn't see very many um, that felt otherwise. Uh, we also did not do the survey to find out whether or not climate action was a good idea. We have um, you know, we have that from our board of commissioners saying, hey, we need to have a plan that gets us to this goal. And so um, part of what we thought we might find in the survey was uh, some sense of maybe areas of action where there might be more confusion or more hesitancy um, or more information or support would be needed. And that, that that might let us understand what areas of action we might need to do more to sort of uh, build or prepare the way for, uh, not that we wouldn't wouldn't do that eventually, right? But that um, it might take more preparation and lead time before we would be able to turn our attention to something. That was one of the reasons why we did the survey. And I just want to underscore um, the, the questions about the modeling. It is, I think, important to keep in mind that the, the purpose and function of the model is you know, somewhat limited. It, it doesn't make decisions for us. It just illustrates the impact of certain assumptions uh, about you know, actions and practices uh, on our direct emissions. And their sequestration is not the only part of our um, climate picture that, that was not modeled. Um, and, and so um, we definitely fully expect to see um, sequestration ideas and ideas as well around consumption and resilience in, in, the, in the plan, even though those things were not and could not be modeled. So those were my additional comments, thanks. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, Brittany? I'm going to head into the chat here really quick. I'm going to mm -hmm. take about a couple more questions here, and then we need we do need to move on. But uh, remember that we will take the, uh, your questions um, after this as well. Um, so Julia says it does look from the like from the pre-read that the model does not reach zero with the addition of sequestration. Does that get us to net zero? So we're still looking at sequestration options, but yes, it should get us to zero. Um, <clears throat> question from Nina. Are the goals for the county as a whole or merely the emissions in on incorporated county? So the county as a whole. Um, and so the way that it's structured, Ina, and, and we you will see this when I send out the implementation guide after this meeting, um, it's sort of like a county facing out uh, piece. So a climate action plan is a very interesting sort of planning uh, tool um, at a local government level. So typically uh, local, governments, municipalities, and counties would only be developing plans that they have complete control over. So an active transportation plan, you can decide how many bike lanes to put in, where those bike lanes are gonna be. Of course, you'd wanna consult the public, but the, the county has control over that. With the climate action plan, it's very different. We're looking at the whole scope of the community, um, but I can't tell you know industry to move over to renewable natural gas when it comes available. I can't tell people to put solar panels on, on their roof, and the county can't either, right? 
um, that would be a pretty heavy hand. And, and I'm sure there's some some things at the state level even that wouldn't allow it. So um, how everything is framed is from the county looking out. So there are places where the county can lead. So that's, for example, policies or uh, actions in its own buildings and um, and facilities. There's places where the county can support. So that's providing maybe incentives. It's providing education, um, guidance in some way. It's partnerships and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there's parts where the county can advocate mm -hmm. um, and ask, you know, higher levels of government to provide support in different ways, or maybe it's other partners and stakeholders. So that's the way that um, that's the way it's looking. Um, there are some pieces in the uh, low carbon assumptions where we've had to say, you know, we think this in unincorporated, er unincorporated areas and this in, um, you know, more urban areas. So uh, transportation modes, um, you know, how many people are going to be using vehicles versus active modes is one of those places. Um, okay, for now, I am going to move on. Please put your questions in the chat. Um, and we will, uh, we will continue to follow up. So I am going to get into the final low carbon model, um, the modeled actions and results. Um, so I just want to go over this, our order of operations for low carbon actions. Of course, we look at, um, are there activities that can be avoided that generate emissions or require energy? Is there anything that's redundant that we don't need? Uh, reduce uh, energy required by using less and by avoiding wasted energy. So a lot of the time, this is our energy efficiency upgrades in homes and buildings. Replace, so switching to renewable energy sources. So this would be moving from, you know, fossil fuel-based uh, energy sources over to wind, solar, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, whatever it may be. Uh, then we look at removal. So this is your sequestration piece. We do tend to look at sequestration after we look at um, the avoid, reduce, and replace. Um, it is always, uh, we always look at, can we reduce the emissions in place? So that means if a building is um, causing emissions, can we reduce those in place before, before we look at sort of an outside uh, solution? Uh, but certainly sequestration plays a role. Um, and it's the same with offsets. Offsets, we always leave to the end. Um, because there may be some places in, in the county, in the system, in the energy system that are very difficult to reduce our emissions from. So that's where um, we might invest in uh, emissions reductions initiatives, basically. Uh, but a lot of the time, where why we leave off, offsets to, to the end is because with our other actions, we tend to, with some of them, we get a return on investment. So it actually makes good financial sense. Uh, to do some of these other transitions. With an offset, we know there's no payback. You pay for that. It's it's a financial mechanism um, and there is no return on investment. So we do leave that to the end. And at this point, um, with the availability of sort of actions that can happen locally in Clackamas County and the sequestration potential, we don't really see a, a need for offsets at this point. But uh, as we get closer to the end, it may be something that we have to visit in some of those sort of difficult to difficult to reach um, emissions pockets. Uh, so what we modeled, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly for us. So all new buildings are net zero energy ready by 2030. Um, and so that increases um, between 2023 and 2030. Um, so new buildings, of course, we don't, buildings are long lasting assets. We don't want new buildings having emissions. Um, new county facilities have a carbon neutral strategy in place. Um, and then we're looking at 80% uh, of new homes moving towards electric heating and cooling, 50% air source uh, heat pumps and 50% ground source heat pumps, 80% of water heating in new homes being electric by 2025 and 100% by 2030, and 75% of new non-replacement housing being built in key centers and corridors that have been identified uh, by transportation analysis zones. And this was, um, this last one was work that was already being looked at by the county. And we get into building retrofits. So we of course know that buildings are a huge source of uh, emissions and energy use. 
um, older buildings especially can be inefficient uh, and need upgrades. So we're looking at um, what we would call deep energy retrofits uh, in all existing buildings. So that's 50% thermal savings and 10% uh, plug load savings uh, by 2040, which is a significant amount of work. Um, and then 80% of existing building space heating, cooling, space heating and cooling needs are met by electric systems by 2040. 90% air source, 10% ground source. And this is really a function of the fact that air source heat pumps are easier to add to existing buildings than ground source if there isn't already um, uh, uh, a system in place that, that can be leveraged for the ground source. Um, and then 100% of existing buildings water heating needs are met by electric systems by 2040 in line with the retrofit schedule. So you'll start to notice a trend here in our buildings that we are looking at electrification in a lot of the buildings. Um, yeah, I, I will mention this later on as well. We do see certainly a role for natural gas and maybe potentially there'll be other roles, uh, uh, fuels in the future. We haven't modeled anything else yet. Um, but um, the reason for the electrification isn't because we prefer electrification over any other um, heating sources or energy sources. We're pretty, we work in a pretty fuel agnostic uh, sort of uh, the point of view or perspective. Uh, we've looked at the uh, projected renewable natural gas availability, availability in Oregon, and we've downscaled that to Clackamas. And then we've sort of, in the model, we've placed that in the hardest to electrify sector. So you'll see that pop up more in the industrial sector. And then we've taken um, electricity as, um, uh, we've taken buildings as an easier to electrify route. Um, these are always things that can change. So this is a good example of how a scenario is a scenario. Um, we can't predict the future. I know in some of the places we're working right now, we're hearing from natural gas companies and from some of our other stakeholders saying, you know, we think that there's new sources of uh, renewable natural gas that are going to come online. We think there's more availability. If there is great, um, I, I think that would actually be, you know, pretty make it simpler <laughs> in, in buildings that are already set up for natural gas. Right now, we don't have the data to um, sort of support that. Um, so that could change in the future. It's the same with, uh, with hydrogen. Um, hydrogen doesn't seem to be as much of a, um, of a focus in, in Clackamas or Oregon. That could change in the future and that would change um, what this scenario would actually look like. Those are all zero emission sources, all good sources. Um, so all things that could happen in the future, but we've basically we've, uh, we've modeled this way for now based on availability. Um, energy generation. So 30% of residential and business customers purchase carbon-free electricity by 2025 by the program that's already in place at PNG. All electricity is produced by non-emitting sources by 2040. And so that is a part of HB 2021, so a statewide uh, targets. So we're hoping that uh, you know that will come into play, and uh, and that can be sort of some weight off of the county's shoulders or resident shoulders. Um, One hundred percent of new residential buildings include solar PV to account for half of the individual uh, building energy demand by 2035. All new county facilities, including solar PV, ground mount. Um, the ground mount solar and wind installations, however, do not increase. Um, so we spoke with the county, we had a lot of discussions about this um, and decided to move forward with that because we don't wanna have a duplication uh, with HB 2021, if that's coming into play and there is a plan for that, um, there's kind of not this need uh, to increase it um, at the community scale at this point is our understanding. Um, and then looking at all natural gas being carbon neutral via RNG or offsets um, by 2035 and fossil free um, after 2050. Uh, vehicle emissions. So, you know, the shift towards basically electric vehicles. Uh, first, it will be the light duty, then the medium duty, because we know availability wise, that's sort of the trajectory that we're on. The lighter, lighter duty vehicles are going to come first. Um, hopefully the availability uh, crunch will be over here very soon. Uh, then we'll move towards the heavy duty vehicles. We know that those are really going to start coming online in the early 2030s. Um, 
And then looking at um, basically by the end of our scenario, which is 2050, everything being moved over to a zero emission source. Uh, in addition, we would see that trend eventually happening in um, equipment purchases for agriculture, forestry, and off-roading. Um, that's a little bit later uh, in the scenario. Um, and we haven't been fuel specific there um, because we know there are still, um, there's still a lot happening in the marketplace, whether some of those pieces are going to be electric, electric, hydrogen, or other fuels. Um, and uh, and then we would see that transition with transit as well. That transition uh, is already beginning, at least uh, with some of the transit services. We move on to active transportation and transit use. We would want to see mode share shift in line with the transportation plan targets. Um, so there are new targets being put in place at the county level. So we have uh, modeled that as low carbon in the low carbon scenario. So um, there is a difference between, like I mentioned, the mode share in urban areas versus non-urban areas. Um, we also see 12% of commutes being replaced with, with remote work by 2025. Um, I believe we're already at around 8% um, of uh, work being done from home at this point. And then on the waste side, a reduction in organic waste sent to landfills by 50% by 2030. This is work that's already underway uh, through programs uh, at the county and 90% by 2040. Uh, and then we'd want to maximize the uh, local renewable natural gas generation um, at the wastewater treatment plants uh, and facilities in Clackamas County uh, and utilize right, those right in those buildings. Um, and then, of course, produce renewable natural gas and other fuels locally from wastewater treatment. And then other, again, inside of the model are the sequestr sequestration actions and consumption-based emissions actions. So you won't see those show up here uh, in this piece. I'm gonna pause really briefly here for some questions, um, but I'm, I wanna move us along quickly and we will get back to folks. I look, it looks like Chris is answering. Um, we are contracted for 10% currently today. Just, Have you, um, just one second here. Nina's had her hand up for a little while, so maybe we can go to, okay. go to the chat, yeah. okay? Yeah, I was actually just reading Nina's there. Did you have a different question, Nina? Yeah, Nina, did, or did it get answered? It's Nina, by the way. And I oh, have oh, sorry, a lot Nina. of questions and issues. We'll probably need to take this offline. I don't want to waste people's time. Okay, sure. We can do that. We would love to have a, an offline conversation. Great. All right, Bill. I, you know, so much of this model, uh, modeling actions, is based on increased uh, electric use. And I guess if I was one of the commissioners, I'd ask uh, who is representing primarily PGE because they're the, the only ser server in the county besides Canby that has uh, direct uh, service with BPA. But who has um, evaluated uh, a number of things? You know, do we have enough infrastructure? That's always the key. Uh, is there enough? renewable power available because you know we're hearing that Oregon potentially could be in brownouts in another year or two so I guess the question is can are these goals um, realistic for you know looking at 100 percent by a certain date and without input from um, PG or the power folks and maybe they have talked to you but uh, anyway that's my question I'll try to cut it short thank you yeah, that's a great question, Bill. And I'm going to let Chris jump in here as well. So basically, um, what we understand is there will be an increase in electricity demand, um, whether um, whether the low carbon uh, scenario is implemented or not. So you have two sort of distinct pathways um, that are that could happen. Um, uh, um, one is in the business is planned, you have a growing population and increased energy use. Um, and so electricity demand increases that way. And then in the low carbon, we do see a shift towards more electrification, but we're uh, conducting some of the energy efficiency um, pieces alongside with that. And so you will see an increase in demand for electricity. Um, I, I don't have the specifics in front of me about how much more that will be than in just a business as planned scenario. Um, but, you know, it is a question either way. Um, it also, you know, it's a good point about, you know, what the scenario means. So 
um, a low carbon scenario and pathways, really it's a house of cards. So you can't do uh, part of the scenario and not others. So um, you can't move towards electrification without doing energy efficiency measures because you know, you're gonna, it's not gonna work on the grid um, for cost reasons as well. Um, it just, it doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of factors that get put together. Um, and then we look at the scenario, uh, scenario wide level. Chris, did you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, you know, that obviously these are all very valid concerns and uh, I, would, I would say definitely worth thinking and bringing up to the commission, but as you know, as far as the scope of this project, we're tasked with looking at the whole transmission um, and electricity supply of, of the Pacific Northwest, which is a big, uh, big region and very interconnected. So, um, you know, definitely further, you know, further examination and study would be required. And what we're, what we're proposing is a possible pathway for, for meeting targets. And, you know, it's not the pathway is going to be set in stone, as we suggested already, there's going to be uh, you know, lots of moderation variation as we move forward with the path, but it's it's a pathway of worth exploring and and asking these questions about. So, um, yeah, a great great question. Um, but we haven't looked at that at that part of the uh, of the of the scope because this wasn't in the scope of the, the project we were tasked with. Yeah, and I just saw uh, uh, another question in there just about uh, the cost of electricity. So we have. Uh, we, we can share the financial assumptions that uh, went into the back end of the financial model, but we do see a, an increase in the cost of electricity um, over this uh, over the period of the scenario. And so we do use um, numbers from um, from government uh, government sources on price projections. Um, and then we have actually to be extra conservative. We have uh, added the green electricity fee. Um, that's currently being charged um, through through customers that are opt in to to sort of the whole um, to to everyone to all electricity um, once uh, once the grid is being cleaned. So um, so there are two pieces there, basically. Okay, um, I'm going to present these results. I want to get through this so people have an opportunity to engage uh, in the discussion. So. Uh, in the questions that we have planned. So energy use by sector um, in our uh, low carbon uh, scenario, basically you're seeing things uh, shift downwards in transportation. Um, electric vehicles, not only are they, um, they're not zero emissions unless the grid is zero emissions or, or the source you're getting them from is zero emissions. So something to keep in mind, uh, but they are more efficient motors. So you do see um, less energy being used in the transportation sector. Residential uh, is uh, there's less energy being used, and of course that's a function of energy efficiency upgrades. Commercial, you see that a little bit. Uh, industrial stays basically the same, and and there was never much there in municipal and agriculture. We move on to see oh, right, energy use by fuel type. So we're seeing gasoline really come out of the scenario here as we move towards electric vehicles, and that's really where we see a pickup in grid electricity. Um, and then of course we see natural gas as well. Um, that shift where we've taken some out of the residential sectors. Um, and then again, we see diesel being squeezed out here as, as vehicles are replaced uh, with, with uh, low emission sources. Um, and then all of our other ones here um, stay relatively the same. Electricity procurement uh, peters out here. Uh, and then RNG you see increases significantly. So some of this um, natural gas, not only does some of it shift down to electricity, a lot of it shifts up into the renewable natural gas sector. Uh, energy use per capita overall, uh, it's cut in about half um, between the business as planned uh, scenario and the low carbon scenario per capita. Um, so keeping in mind here, there will be some population growth. When we look at emissions by sector, so um, we have seen a significant decrease in emissions in the low carbon scenario. Um, and this, of course, is without sequestration. So without sequestration, we get uh, an 84% reduction in emissions. And so we're looking at that other 16% and how to best meet that through sequestration. Um, so we see a significant decrease again 
in emissions from transportation as the grid greens and we move towards electric vehicles. Residential uh, peters out to almost nothing. Um, again, HB 2021 is a huge, uh, huge help there and, and the electrification uh, plays into that. Industrial, um, you know, decreases a little bit, but stays relatively the same. We didn't find solutions for all of the, all of industry, um, although we have added some renewable natural gas in there. Commercial peters out as well, very much the same as um, residential. Agriculture decreases just slightly and waste decreases somewhat as well. Um, by fuel type, so you'll see the grid electricity um, gets down to nothing by 2040. And again, that is the impact of HB uh, uh, 2021. Uh, gasoline decreases um, until it's basically gone in 2050 um, when that electric full electrification of vehicles happens or other fuel sources. Natural gas, excuse me, <coughs> the emissions do decrease significantly as we see more RNG coming online. Non-energy is still there, so that's some of our waste um, and some of the industrial processes. And then jet fuel is still part of the equation as well. We see quite a bit of air travel. Uh, Chris, can I get you to talk through the wedges here for us? You bet. Um, so the wedge diagram uh, shows us the pathway of getting from the reference scenario, in this case, the business's plan, which is the top line, all the way down to the low carbon or the, the, the final scenario. And so each wedge represents uh, the different actions that we've modeled and the size of the wedge represents the emissions reductions for, for each of those actions. So you can see here the personal use vehicle, electrification of personal use vehicles, as you know, this creates a fairly large wedge as we would expect since, um, <clears throat> since we're replacing, you know, fossil fuels with uh, relatively clean electricity uh, in, from, from the state uh, going forward. So, uh, and, and, and so we can use this to understand kind of the, the impact or implica implications of each of these actions and, and not necessarily to pick winners and losers, because as you can see, all of these actions need to, to happen to take place to get us to the goal, but to understand kind of maybe where we can focus some energy or maybe where we need to push a little harder to, to, to help things move along. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Okay, and then from that, you see that emissions per capita, again, without our adding in sequestration at this point, we move from what would have been 5.7 tons per person. Sorry, that says megatons there. Sorry, metric tons, um, uh, which it's 5.7 in, um, in uh, 2050 in our businesses plant, 1.2 in our low carbon. When we look at uh, the impact this has financially, um, there is a return uh, on this low carbon scenario. So it's around um, uh, $7 billion across the community. So um, to explain financials in a little more depth, what we look at is we look at the capital expenditure required to make these low carbon shifts. And then we look at the costs or savings uh, related to maintenance with the new um, equipment and assets that are in place. We look at the energy costs or savings, um, and then we would look if there were a carbon tax or levy in Clackamas County or in the state, um, how you might save money by moving to renewable resource sources. There is no carbon levy uh, or tax in Oregon or in Clackamas County, so that doesn't come into play here. But what we do see is a fair bit of energy savings. So we do see through efficiency measures largely, a lot of money being saved on energy expenditures. We do see some operation and maintenance savings as well. Um, and then on the capital expenditure side, we do see some significant uh, expenditures uh, that need to be made. I believe over the scenario, it's about $17 million or billion dollars in expenditures. And so, um, so it is significant. Um, we see you know, that really ramping up between uh, now and 2040. Um, so that's when the bulk of the actions will occur. Um, we see them happening uh, earlier on in the scenario, of course, to make sure that um, the target is reached by 2050. Um, 
And um, what we can also do is look at this um, in an amortized perspective so that all of those costs wouldn't be coming at once. So Chris, I'm just gonna ask you to look at the, to explain the present value. Uh, right, so uh, this graph is showing uh, the net present value of the various uh, economic sectors that we were, that were categories that we're looking at. So um, the net present value, we're discounting uh, future costs at a rate of 3%. So this is our initial kind of starting point. Uh, we can definitely explore various different uh, discount rates for various different actions either, or even. So you know, we understand that more, um, uh, I guess uh, the like private sector discount rates are much higher than than the public sector, for example, or the county discount rate, for example. Um, so, and uh, by discounting, basically what we're saying for those who are unfamiliar with it is that um, investments or savings out in the future are worth are worth <laughs> worth less than than they are uh, today. So we're so the farther the the you, you can, as you can see we have you know as we're making more and more changes and savings are 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 accumulating those savings are worth worth less uh, uh, in the future with the discounting rate uh, and the higher the discount rate the less uh, the the lower the worth worth is. So um, this is showing uh, the results of that going uh, across all of the different investments and and costs that we have. Uh, uh, explored in this and and to to kind of add to the to to what Brittany has been saying so not we're, we don't have every single cost associated with this there's just some costs that are you know hard to come by or, or unknown um, but um, this is looking at the costs all the costs that we have explored and uh, that that those assumptions will be shared with the group uh, as well yeah absolutely so we'll always share those so things like any we don't have any ground mount solar in this but typically we don't look at things like land purchases. Um, we also external to the model. We are doing some calculations, but we leave things like the health benefits um, decreases and things like COPD um, decrease uh, visits to um, to the ER due to things like air quality issues impacting um, people's health. We do leave those external to the model as well. Those aren't included, but certainly that's a co-benefit of uh, some of this work. So um, in the pre-read, um, which you can read post as well. Um, we have provided um, some information, more information on how we do our financial modeling. And we've done an action by action breakdown of the costs and, and uh, returns for each, each one of the actions. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over here. We are capturing your questions. I do wanna move on to sort of asking you some questions and getting some targeted feedback. Um, so if you could turn back over to Mentimeter, I will see if we can get the link shared again. We want to know um, what do you like about what you saw in the low carbon scenario? What do you think is going to uh, to work well in Clackamas County? What are you optimistic about? Just as a heads up, we'll also be asking you about what you know didn't go far enough, what should be pushed further. There's a whole series of questions to get your feedback on this. Thank you. Yeah, we won't, we you won't can... just ask you about the rainbow and such. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, and we also just wanted to ask double barreled questions where you ask like, what did you like and what did you not like all in one question? And Kiana's just shared the direct link into Mentimeter too, in case you need it. And then you can pop right in there and let us know if there's uh, what you liked about what you saw in the low carbon scenario. Thanks everyone for your questions so far too and your patience. As we said, it's a lot of information. Julie says the link takes her to the first slide of the presentation, not this question. Okay, we'll just reactivate it there and it should take you there automatically, Julia. Let us know if it doesn't. And thanks for letting us know that. It is actually set to uh, participants. So participants will need to move forward. We did that so people can still participate after. Oh, is that why? So it's not automatic. So if you just advance forward, then um, Julia, you'll be able to get to this question. Okay, so like the aggressive timeline for how fast the US, US government operates and focus on retrofitting current buildings. Thank you for that. Timeline seemed pretty good.
you can of course um, yeah you can participate in the chat as well yeah and also so we just see three people in mentimeter right now so if more of you could join or let us know if you're having trouble joining that would be helpful demonstrated benefits from known technologies yeah mm -hmm. yeah as i mentioned like we're um you know we get these questions a lot um in canada more so i would say this is more of a canadian example but we get asked about things like um small modular nuclear reactors um and we sometimes have people that are upset that they haven't been included um and and we'd like to take a pretty fuel agnostic approach um and uh, we do we do look at technology that is currently viable and it's not. So we have a pretty good sense of, you know, when EVs are coming online, even for medium and heavy duty, we know early 2030 with something like small modular nuclear reactors, there's more uncertainty. We're not at a technology sort of maturity date with that. And so we don't model that currently because we can't, um, even from a scenario per perspective, we don't want to take bets on whether that technology is going to come fully to fruition to market availability. Um, so we kind of play in that space of, of what we know is available or is coming online or is at a certain maturity stage. Um, but certainly, like I mentioned before, with with RNG, it's it's uh, it's scenario based and those things can change very rapidly. Um, I unfortunately cannot predict the future. That is one of my limitations. So. Um, but I, I appreciate that comment. Uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah. You don't have that skill set yet. Okay, well, we should uh, we should do that. I'll work in, on that. In house training with you later. Yeah. Next <laughs> next year's work plan development. <laughs> Transportation electrification. There will be a lot of EVs on the road over the next decade plus, and I like that model. Assumes a lot of kilowatt hours ahead. Yeah, certainly, and it's an important consideration. That's a transformative effect in it in and of itself if it's what's pursued. And uh, I sat on BC Hydro, so for here in British Columbia, where I live, on our electrification um, and efficiency um, a task force, and uh, you know, just sort of getting a look at the size of what that would be like for our province um, was no small no small feat. Like the financial analysis, it might be what was emailed yesterday, but not sure if it's sufficiently rigorous. Aggressive timeline is great and still concerned about the willingness ability of BPA and PGE to provide a grid we can trust and potentially high value to the local economy over time. Let's go to the next question and we'll take a question from Nina as well. Thanks, Nina, for letting me know how to pronounce your name as well. Um, I don't, I, when I go to this, I can't seem to get on to it. I just get, it sends me back to Miro. Oh, Miro, is that where I put, do I do a sticky there? I'm not sure. Oh, thanks for asking. No, it's a separate link for a separate tool. So um, there might be, um, if you if you copy the link from the chat into your browser bar. I'm just gonna get it again. Yeah, that should take you. We'll, we'll put it in there for you again as well. Predicting the future is easy. Getting it right is a little harder. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I don't know though. I mean, some some would say humans are terrible at predicting the future. I wonder about those futurists from time to time myself. I mean, but I could be wrong, you know, too. <laughs> but I think I think we are agree in agreement on getting it right uh, is difficult. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I appreciate that the comments about the financials wondering how rigorous. Um, we're happy to share the financial assumptions as well um, and the sources of our financial assumptions. So uh, that's not an issue at all. And then you can see what's included and what's excluded. And that, that will always come as a report and uh, that you would see before that goes to the board as well. Um, there are certain things that, again, with costs, we just can't know about the future. So we base it on a lot of those uh, government sources at the, at the current time. Um, but we will be very clear about what was included and what was not. Okay, I'm going to- um, and just want to check in, Nina. Oh, that's neat. Nina, did you oh, get yeah, in? Were you, were you able to get in there with that link put in the chat again? Did that did that work? No, it just takes me to the Miro board on the Mentimeter thing. It just goes through till it says join us on Miro. I don't, I can't go any further than that. Okay, I'm gonna work some magic here. Give me two seconds. Oh, yeah, you're in the presentation. Yeah. So and yeah, the, the whole thing is in there. So you should be able to keep advancing. But yeah, Brittany's gonna work her magic. Don't worry. I'm gonna what I'm gonna do. Um, is I'm going to set this to uh, presenter mode, which means I'm going to control where everybody's at in the presentation. So we're all on the same slide if you're in Mentimeter. And then after we're done tonight's presentation, I will change it back to audience mode, which means you will be able to go in uh, and, and look at the presentation and continue to answer questions. But I want to make sure for right now that we're all on the same page. So um, I am going to do that.
Great. Um, um, while you do that, Williams added the future is made, not predicted. I enjoy that we're moving into a more philosophical <laughs> discussion about the future with this group. I think that's important. Thank you for that, William. Uh, I also want to open it up. Anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet, uh, we'd like to hear from you. So I'm going to give a few moments to see if you would like to ask a question or if you've got a comment that you'd like to contribute while Brittany works her technological magic in the background. Also interested if anyone wants to put in the chat what your favorite Canadian chocolate bar is, if you have one, <laughs> if you ever have one of the ones that we have, or and or Canadian based dessert treat. We were having a conversation as the meeting was starting, and I, I have a cold, and so I just took some Buckleys, um, and I was confirming with the Americans online that it's it is a very Canadian thing. Uh, it is cough syrup that is like Tylenol based, um, but it has like pine and spruce needles and tar in it that are supposed to like really really help. Um, and I realized as I was taking it that that's probably a very Canadian thing that uh, friend, our, our friends from other places are probably not drinking down pine tar as uh, yeah, it's gross. The way to cure their cold. Your yeah. famous ads were like, "Take Buckley's. It tastes gross, but it'll get rid of your." It's it's, it's gross, but it works. Was their tagline? Yeah. Yeah. But All right, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anybody good. now that is in Menti uh, should. Uh, should be Buckley's <laughs> that's your favorite chocolate bar and Nymo bars yeah that's a good one um so anybody that's in uh, Menti now uh should be on this question page so I've set it to my pace um so you shouldn't have an option but to be here if you're in Menti yeah Nina let's check in with you are you there is are you able to get in I'm determined to help get you in into nope Still can't get in, and I have a lot really? of concerns, questions, all that sort of thing. It just it says waiting to refresh. That's all. Okay. So in the meantime, can you just answer in the chat for us then too, so you can put your answers to the questions in there um, for us, and we will grab them and make sure that we get them included too. Absolutely. And if you're not comfortable putting it, like sort of with your name behind it, you can also message us privately, um, follow up with an email, uh, follow up with a conversation. We're happy to do that. Okay, Great. in the meantime, we're gonna move on to the next question. Bring everybody along here with me. So, oh, let's go back. Was anything pushed too far? Does anything feel not achievable? Does anything feel too ambitious? It did have a question. Yes, please ask. Sure. Yeah. So, so is is all this modeling based on like projected growth in the industries that we have as well, or you know, I, I know population growth is a part of it, but I don't know, you know, was all that accounted for, like wine industry things like that. I'm going to pass that over to Chris, but we do, uh, it's as good as the data is, is okay. as good of, as this model is. And cool. so some of that data would have came back, uh, a lot of it would have come from the county and from other government sources. But Chris, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, so uh, you know, as, as Brittany said, as good as the data is, we did get employment, like general employment projections. Now, we didn't get detailed kind of by industry where growth was, was necessarily going to happen. So, we, you know, that could be something to be considered but generally you know when kind of aware there was industry that would be growing alongside the the same as as the employment growth going forward okay thanks all right i'm not seeing a lot of um answers pop up here i just want to do a quick check-in that people are coming along with us um and that people are okay getting to the was anything pushed too far question Looks like we just have two participants, three now in there. What I'm going to suggest as well is that um, for time's sake, we will um, we will continue to move along um, unless we feel like any big issues here with being able to access. We absolutely have access to this uh, for, for one week afterwards. So it will be open to you. Um, 
and you can provide us with your comments and feedback uh, on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to move along here. Uh, were things not pushed far enough? Is there anywhere? And I think I kind of saw that in the last question. Um, you know, is there anything we're missing? Is there places where we can be more ambitious? Are there places where we can, you know, leverage other technologies? In terms of summarization, Jeff, to answer your question, it's um, it's easier for us to have answers in there. But as we've said, you can just use the chat if that's easier for you. Yeah, you can use the chat, certainly. We do want to make sure everything's captured. Is Great. 100% instead of 80% electrification. Low carbon concrete renewable diesel. We are going to continue to move forward here. And like I said, uh, you can continue to follow up and answer these questions afterwards. Um, so our big question here that we want to ask is based on the actions you've seen, what opportunities uh, are you seeing for implementation at this point? Like what excites you, you know, based on the actions? Um, are there some of that how work, I guess? Um, do you see some ways these uh, these actions can come into, you know, become reality in practice? How do we do that? And so like we've mentioned, if uh, if you can answer in Menti, if you're in there, that's great. And if not, please answer in the chat. Or raise your hand and let us know, have a chat about it. Is there anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet would like to ask a question? We'd love to hear from you. We wanna hear from as many people as possible. Bill, you have a question? Yeah, I was trying to type and it didn't show up in Menti, but anyway, uh, so I'm still unclear. It, is the model actions that you sent out and the ones today, are is this in a draft or is this final? The, mo the modeled actions are final. Okay, so there will be no, I guess I use the term peer review from um, electric, uh, folks pg whoever to we've done yeah we've done all the engagement the county has made the decision for the actions and the model to be final at this point so so these models will be put into action or is uh, is there going to be still some time to say that and for instance uh you know it may not be possible to achieve 50 or 100 percent i can't be specific on some of the, the the goals here but in the time yeah. frame that you've uh, specified i mean is this are these uh models realistic at this point i guess that, that's my question so it sounds like they're cast in stone ready to go so the the model itself is so so remembering again that the model is scenario based so it's not a prediction of the future um, based on the current technologies and, you know, sort of tools available to us at this time, this is how we could get as close as possible to uh, the target um, that was set by, by the county, by the board. Um, 
And then we have what comes next, what we're about to talk about, which is the implementation mechanism. So this is how we're doing it. So the way we look at that is this is a community-wide plan. And like I mentioned, the county has a role to play at that in that. And we're really looking at this from the county perspective, looking out. So there's places where they can lead, places where they can support and places where they can advocate. So if they put in all of the effort possible, um, would this be achieved? Not necessarily, right? Because other players need to come to the table. Will it shift and change over time? Yes, um, because scenario modeling is not perfect. Okay, great. I think that answered my question. Thank you. Yeah, can I just Oops. jump in uh, and add to that too? Um, Bill, I, I don't, sorry, I'll turn my video on. I, I don't know if this is helpful, but I just want to emphasize that the model is, uh, it's a scenario, it's a tool. It's not a, it, the model doesn't represent decisions, right? Um, and so um, it's, you know, I think intended for us to see kind of what are the carbon and economic impacts of various actions. Um, we've chosen not to, to do another round of modeling in the scope of this project uh, for the sake of, of time and budget, but um, it doesn't rule out the possibility of doing uh, more economic modeling in the future if we think that that could help us um, uncover uh, some additional insights, right? Um, wouldn't necessarily rule it out. It's just not in the scope for this project. Thanks. Okay, Dave, and then we'll move on. Just, I, I just quickly, just my biggest concern with all this is just being a former structural engineer and having modeled things for 40 years, and that if you got your model wrong, people would die. Uh, my concern is, is that if, if we don't start off on the best foot with the best data, or at least provide a spectrum of possible scenarios, say three, you know, like you do in climate change, uh, then I, 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 I guess a lot of people could throw stones at this model, you know, and, and my concern is, is that what I'm learning about so far is that the utilities, I mean, I, we haven't seen anything feed, feedback from the utilities, you know, that, yeah, they agree with this. We can do this, you know, I mean, I, and it would be nice to know that, that PGE and all the others, Northwest Natural, they, they, they feel that something like this is feasible. I think that would go a long way to lending some credibility to, to whatever scenario is put forward, but in the meantime, at least have a spectrum of scenarios to say, okay, we we do this, this is all we can hope for. But if we do this, we can achieve this much kind of thing. So that that that's my comment. Yeah, absolutely. Point taken, Dave. I think um, you know, there's a couple of uh, we raise a couple of issues there. Certainly, um, you know, the quality of the model depends on the quality and availability of data. Um, so that is, of course, al always a limitation. Um, and the other piece is again, you know, scenario based. We can't we can't predict the future. We can do sensitivity analysis on this to say, okay, what if, um, you know, what if hydrogen plays a bigger role in Oregon right now? That wasn't uh, a place that you know the county was ready to explore at this time. But what if hydrogen plays a bigger role within Clackamas County? What if RNG availability increases? What if so we could do all of those what if uh, pieces. Um, it's really a question of scope at this point. Um, and so that's really where, where we stand is, is, you know, we have we have modeled to the best of our ability within within the scope. Um, and that that is certainly a limitation within this. And so the perspective I would suggest looking at it from is, you know, climate action needs to happen. So let's let's start now. And I, I would really like for us to move forward and focus on that the how right um and how we can get implementation started on some of these pieces um because that is going to be you know if we if we continue to look at at modeling um you know modeling can be re revised over time as new data becomes available as new information new new market trends uh happen um but if we don't start talking about the how then then we can talk about the what you know essentially forever and I guess I just want to jump in and add, so, you know, if we agree that the target is net zero, there's not a lot of room or a lot, a lot of different scenarios to explore. You know, the, you know, many of the other scenarios would be, what if we do a little bit less, a little bit slower, and that's just going to move the line up and get it farther away from the target. So, um, 
<laughs> you know, there's, if, if we're trying to get to net zero, it's a big transformational change. It's going to be bumpy and it's going to require a lot of effort and, um, and it's going to be messy and it's going to require further analysis for sure. So uh, I guess I'm just not sure which kind of avenues or, you know, it would be interesting to hear what other scenarios you'd like to explore uh, maybe in the chat uh, as a kind of a broad outline of, of what, how you would describe that scenario. Because really, you know, you have to pull all the levers available to the community in order to get to net zero. There's not a lot of leftover. Yeah. Great. Just being mindful of time, I'm going to answer Nina's question here, and then uh, we are going to move forward um, so that we can provide the next steps. Nina, if you wanted to go ahead with your question. Sorry about that. You, you guys just go ahead. I'm going to put a link in the chat. That'll be fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about our next steps now, um, and then we will do public comment. We will save some time for that. Um, so implementation guide. So um, I want to talk about this. This is an incredibly important piece towards implementation. So we've spent all this time, again, talking about the what, the, and that is what the model is good at identifying, especially when we have these ambitious targets. So the physical reality and changes required to meet the target. That's what we've been focused on uh, to this point. And that's what can be modeled. So again, what happens if we retrofit 80% of buildings versus 90% of buildings? What if um, you know, we move towards electric vehicles by 2040 instead of 2035? Um, so that's what we've been looking at to this point. And now we need for a localized implementation to occur, we do need to move from the what to the how. So we move from the physical reality and changes required to meet the target and what can be modeled into the education programs, policies, initiatives, and investments that need to occur in order to achieve the physical reality that was modeled. So again, keeping in mind that physical reality that we modeled is a scenario, it could change over time. Things are gonna change as you get into implementation. We're gonna do more engagement. Like I mentioned, things are gonna uh, enter the market that are disruptors that we might not expect right now. Um, you know, COVID-19 was certainly a disruptor that uh, impacted um, climate action. We have work from home, we have supply chain issues. The war in Ukraine was something that disrupted uh, the use of energy globally. So, um, you know, things will shift over time, but we really need to start thinking about the how uh, and implementing. And so we've started to develop this implementation guide. Basically, we've finalized that low carbon scenario. We've explored implementation mechanisms from other jurisdictions. Uh, and from our experience, having done 100 of these, we've reviewed and generated um, some implementation mechanis mechanisms for Clackamas County. Uh, and now we're at the stage where we want you to review those mechanisms. Um, uh, you might recall prior prioritization criteria uh, that were developed early on in the process. So our implementation team at the county uh, reviewed the mechanisms against the prioritization criteria. Uh, and we want the, uh, that is a, a very long process. Uh, we do want the CATF to review them qualitatively. So we're gonna provide you with those uh, implementation mechanisms um, in a spreadsheet form. We're gonna provide you with the opportunity to comment on them suggest new ones, suggest modifications, suggest changes, um, and we'll track all those, we'll incorporate those, and we'll, we'll adjust and modify um, as, as we can. Um, and uh, also, when you, when you do take a look at those, what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, you don't feel the burden of having to, to you know, provide a comment, comment on every single one if you don't want to you're very focused on a particular sector or have a particular interest, please focus on those ones. If you do want to look at them all and comment on them all, please do that as well. Um, so that is that is open at this point. Um, after that, we're going to review the mechanisms both against the comments that the ZATF provided, that the implementation team provided, and that um, comments that were provided sort of through public engagement. We're not putting every implementation mechanism out to the public, but we are gleaning uh, from the public and from other engagement opportunities what the public is interested in, the types of support um, 
that they need in order to participate in implementation. Um, and then we'll provide a draft implementation guide um, after that. So what you're seeing today is in a spreadsheet form. It will be a written guide at the end, um, and it will be eventually what goes to the board. So we will provide you uh, with, with a written draft um, as we get to the end of the process. So our next steps then, uh, this week SSG will provide draft implementation mechanisms for each and every action uh, and instructions for providing input, like I mentioned, that will come to you in a spreadsheet form. Um, and we will require your input back by October 3rd. So you have a few weeks to provide that. Um, and then on September 28th, we have another meeting. So we'll go through this uh, process again to discuss uh, consumption and resilience actions and implementation mechanisms. So we'll bring you through a similar process for those because we haven't talked about those as much. <coughs> um, thank you, Brittany. I was going to say too, we want to thank you very much too for all of your participation and input to this point and continuing to work with us as we go forward in these last few stages um, as well. Kiana is going to place um, an evaluation link in the chat um, so you can sort of click on that and open it up and let us know um, what you would like to see um, sort of moving forward. Um, as well. And Chris, did you have any other wrap up comments before I go to Eben? No, nope, all good here. Thanks. Okay. Fantastic. So we'll include these materials in our follow up email um, and we'll include the links to the Miro board. Mentimeter will be open to if you want to participate in there um, as well. Um, and we'll keep, um, and like I said, the Miro board will be um, open for our entire time um, working together um, as well. And Nina, when you want to send along that information, please feel free to do that. And thanks very much for submitting that report. Um, Eben, any final comments? Any wrap up? Uh, no, I think um, so. In, in each of our uh, CATF meetings, we have provided a moment for uh, public comment. Um, and uh, I, I do not see any attendees at the moment outside um, CATF members. Um, but uh, if anyone wishes to to make a comment uh, sort of on the record in the format of public comment, you, you can do so now um, briefly uh, for a moment. Um, would anyone like to do that? Okay. Then all I have all to right. add is, is my thanks to everyone for uh, for participating today. Before you sign off, could you please confirm the meeting date, 29th, 28th? We have the 29th, the slides of the 28th. Now let me confirm that for you right now. Uh, September 29th, apologies. And you will get a, an invitation coming out for that shortly. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your participation and we will follow up uh, shortly with. Um, those additional opportunities to participate. Thanks, have a great rest of your day.